Okay, I think it's time to start. Even if uh, I don't see our, uh, I don't see Alison, but I guess she will join. Uh, in fact, we have uh, quite a full agenda, so it's better not to waste too much time in the beginning. So this is the Network Coding uh, Research Group meeting. Uh, I am Vincent Roca, and my uh, co-chair, uh, Victor, will participate remotely. Um, this is the usual not well, so please have a look at it. And uh, okay, those are the rules that uh, we all follow in IETF as well as IRTF research groups. So a few information, administrative information. Well, nothing special to say. You have a few links if you need. All the slides have been uploaded between yesterday and today morning, so do not hesitate. They are there, available. Uh, I see that many people, well, many, maybe not so much, but, uh, well, eight people on the Miteco. We will have today two remote presentations, uh, one from Nicola and the other one uh, a bit later in the program. Uh, so we will manage it. Okay, so very briefly, a quick status on uh, active internet draft. We have two internet drafts at the moment. Uh, working group item internet drafts on taxonomy. So you saw on the list that uh, this uh, uh, internet draft passed uh, working well research group last call uh, two months ago, and uh, I submitted it to the uh, next step, that is to say the ISG uh, last call uh, on Monday. So hopefully in a few months uh, by the end of the year it could be. Uh, uh, finalized as an RFC. And then there is also another internet draft on uh, network coding for satellites, and that will be the subject of the first presentation, so I won't say much more. So this is the agenda. As I said, the agenda is quite full and the schedule is quite tight. So if you, have, if you are a presenter, then please uh, be careful not to take too much time. Each of us has approximately 10 minutes, and I will check that uh, we that you do not uh, extend too much beyond those 10 minutes. Uh, the agenda is split into three parts, two main parts, and the remaining one, if we have time, hopefully we will. Uh, the first part is on use cases, use cases where network coding could be or should be, or coding, end-to-end -end coding also, could be applied. So we will go through a few uh, situations, coding for satellite, coding for ICN, CCN, NDN, and uh, coding for other use cases, essentially this uh, idea of coding for uh, overlay uh, networks, with the presentation from Marie Jose. So this is the first part. We will uh, have a, a debriefing at the end, uh, trying to uh, see where we want to go, what we can do if we have the critical mass or not. So taking maybe decisions or at least starting discussing some topics, important topics around those uh, use cases. Then the second part will be devoted to FEC codes, uh, coding, essentially, with the first presentation on uh, that will explain how to increase significantly the speed of encoding decoding operations of any FEC code, in fact. And the second presentation from myself on, well, benefits uh, of uh, sliding window codes for some applications and follow it by a third presentation on uh, FEC and quick. The idea with this presentation on FEC and quick uh, is to see whether it, well, of those presentations is to see whether it makes sense to, to use uh, sliding window codes, I would say, for other uh, use cases within other uh, IETF protocols, not just fake frame as I did, but seeing if it makes sense for Quick, for WebRTC, for payload or such uh, uh, working groups. And then finally, we'll talk about, uh, well, uh, a topic that was uh, brought to the list by uh, Frank. I, I haven't seen him, but at least there is Morton. So if we have time, I hope we'll, uh, that will be the, the final point of the agenda. So as I said, the schedule is very tight, so uh, be careful on that. Um, let's move with the first presentation. Uh, this will be a remote presentation on uh, network coding for satellites. 
So, Nicola? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. So, I give you the Excuse me? You have the floor. Okay. I'm with uh, Emmanuel uh, here. Hi, everybody. We're going to speak to. Do you have a video off stream, Nicola? Do you have the video stream? We don't see anything. You seen it or you don't? Yes, I see it. It is okay. a little bit small, but uh, we can like perfect. Okay, just uh, let's it's, go. It's because we are big. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, this draft is an initiative on uh, making a state of the art of the deployment of network coding and satellite in satellite communications and opportunity for more network coding in uh, such uh, use case. So next slide, please. Um, so the objective of this drafts are split into four slides. The first one is just that uh, here we see a um, satellite, typical multi-gateway satellite ground segment. Uh, it's just to introduce the vocabulary mostly. Uh, basically, we have uh, multiple satellite gateways covering each gateway covering a subset of satellite terminals. And the gateway is further split in three main blocks, uh, which are more uh, detailed in the following. Slide. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. So basically, the objective here of this state of the art at, the, at that moment uh, of that section is to identify and give the keywords that are used in the satellite industry to, to um, in satellite telecommunications and to, um, to better see where and map where it is actually deployed today. Uh, at the moment, uh, the objective is not to go into the details of each of the words that are used here, but basically, if we look at the physical gateway, the last component, and this is where we actually do some uh, interflow coding at the physical layer. So that is um, basically something deployed today, and that is part of the state of the art and, and published in DVB standards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so basically, what we want to do is to first uh, make the state of the art of where it is actually deployed, but also identify opportunities for further usage of network coding in satellite systems, uh, basically uh, based on real deployment of network coding schemes, but also taking feedbacks from different open projects and national projects, companies, and so on. Um, there have been multiple and lots of initiatives uh, in the past, and we want to have uh, broad view of what happened and uh, what are the actual opportunities. Um, so if you go to the next, basically in the next three slides, if is a contribution that we had from the DLR, uh, which is a network coding protocol, uh, the scope, because the schedule is tight and we want to leave room for discussions. Uh, basically, this is the contribution that we have received and that is the kind of contribution that is very useful for this draft because it just it basically describes the use case and the natural network coding protocol for uh, using uh, a satellite uh, platform. Uh, and I guess you can go directly to the next slide. I don't want to go into the details of that protocol. That is not the scope of this presentation. But if you have any question, I guess that the DLR guys would be happy to comment on it. Uh, what we want, what we are looking for, is a global vision and to have a synthetic view of all the activities that happened in that context. And we believe that this kind of analysis would be very useful for future architecture-oriented documents. Um, basically, in, and in other words, we want to have uh, an identification of the best way to use network coding and where we can actually put it, more than only on the physical layer, which is the case at the moment. Uh, the we want the document to be quite generic we don't want it to be we're not looking for a taxonomy like draft and we don't want any specific uh, industry solutions promotions or specific architecture promotions uh, it's more we have in mind the contribution to the more generic architecture documents next next please <coughs> so basically the document at the moment we have uh a first section on the north of satellite topology that is basically describing the reference architecture, which has, I have just earlier presented, but very quickly, just mainly to give uh, the uh, vocabulary that is used in the satellite communication industry. 
and then um, making a state of the art of what is actually deployed at the moment. And on the fourth section is to identify uh, the opportunities for more network coding in satellite systems. And we have also a discussion on specific uh, use case and <coughs> deployability considerations. So that is the draft structure at the moment. And that is why we want to have um, many, basically we can uh, provide lots of work and uh, initial contribution on uh, the two first sections, so section two and section three. Uh, we also have some feedbacks from different projects, but basically if you want to contribute and to provide your uh, contribution and to have your work notified and, in this, and considered in this document, um, we are, uh, that is, will, will be very welcome for section four and five mostly. And I guess you can go to the next slide. Basically, that is more an illustration <coughs> of what we want to do and how we want to have a an, an high level view of what is actually deployed at the moment. And basically, we have uh, the two top uh, figures that have been taken from the taxonomy document when we have the different layers at which uh, the network coding can happen and on the left side and on the right side we have more uh, the nature of the coding whether it is interflow, interflow, single path, multipath, end-to-end -end, and so on and basically try to come up with some sort of table to have a look on where it is actually deployed basically we can have uh, uh, upper layer source uh, coding on the end-to-end -end. we also have at the moment network coding, proper network coding at the physical layer and basically we want to be sure about what is make, making the link with the taxonomy document basically to have an organization view of what is actually deployed and then on the next slide uh, it basically the we have the state of the art and based on all the feedbacks uh, from open union projects national projects any other companies projects to basically identify where we can uh, apply more network coding uh, mapping it with the taxonomy document that is what we want to do uh, we think it's a way to visualize what is actually deployed so basically what is needed at the moment basically uh, what we need is to have some contributions and particularly for section four and five um, we also have proposed a way of organizing the content, but we think that if you have any views on that, we would be happy to discuss and uh, to discuss the different the organization of the writing of this document. And basically, that's all I think. Yeah. Uh, next, and, uh, last one. And last one is uh, it's a summary of what. You know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any comment, question? I have. Okay, I have one. Uh, I, I do appreciate this way of making progress because um, <coughs> having kind of uh, design team uh, that will federate contributions for several people and several people already uh, sent to the list their intention to, to take part in this uh, document writing is very, is, is, I think, a great thing. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Nicola and Emmanuel, for taking this initiative. And I hope that uh, we can make progress on this document uh, rapidly with contributions from everywhere, from everybody who's interested. Uh, I think that we already entered step one. Yep. Yes. I have there are two people waiting. Yes, Marie Jose. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I understand that you want to limit yourself to the satellite link right so vsat to vsat not the whole network infrastructure because um from my experience a lot of sometimes a lot of the need for network coding may not be just over the uh satellite link it could be you know it's the internet right so th this satellite link is connected to other networks but your draft will just look at the satellite link and yes. when you talk about network coding at the physical layer do you mean physical layer network coding or FEC at the network at the physical layer? What is actually deployed is the FEC at the physical layer. What is in the DFB standards? Yeah, because when I hear network coding at the physical layer, there's actually physical layer network coding, which is waveform coding. So um, 
I, I think it should, it should be clear that network coding is at the network layer, not FEC at the physical. It's just a comment. But anyway, so I understand that now okay. you just want to look at the satellite link. Okay, I'm good. Thanks. But uh, maybe a clarification. Uh, we want to look at the satellite network coding, but also taking into account the constraints that we have when you have a multi-gateway satellite, not only the satellite channel, but also the fact that you can have uh, some centralization of specific network functions or the specific functions that are deployed uh, when we split the TCP connections, for example. Uh, we can also do much more things on that. So it's not only at the physical layer, but most also considering higher layers. And we think that the approach that we have can be the same for other access such as cellular, for example. That's why we think it's not only specific to satellite, but also it can be considered considering for a more architectural document, generic. <coughs> Is it yes, hi, this is Victor Fury, BA Systems. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, second um, uh, Vincent to thanking uh, Nicola Semanel for this initiative. Uh, this is uh, very interesting for, I think, for me and for everybody, I, I believe. Um, just a quick question in the interest of time. Uh, is there a particular point or, or um, uh, element in your uh, work that uh, uh, you're still looking into, you know, some research? Is there something that uh, uh, you're uh, trying to figure out that uh, would uh, work better or uh, you're comparing some s solutions? In other words, uh, some of uh, the research, I'm, I'm just asking about the research aspect uh, of this work. <laughs> Uh, so the answer is yes, because at the end of the draft we want to uh, to to provide an overview also about uh, what we can expect in the future. Or uh, one can be which solution could be deployed, and this solution can from uh, can come from um, the experimental um, domain and um, pure research of the research domain. So okay. yes, it is open to uh, experimental uh, yeah. experimental solution. There is a section for that. That that would be great okay. to to have some kind of a lesson learned to everybody. I think that that would be uh, very valuable. Kind of uh, uh, comparing this work, this didn't, this worked in this case and not in that, and so on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you could also uh, make this more visible by having specific uh, research direction or research challenges sections in this uh, internet draft. Maybe such as it is known for the network coding, in the network virtualization working group, they have uh, a document specific to open research challenges and we have we can have some this kind of basically based on the feedbacks that we have and after having summarized everything that has happened in the past, identify further areas of research. Yes, you can add a right. section to that. Yeah, that would be great. Also. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. Anything else? Any other comments? No? Nobody's waiting in the list. I'm waiting to. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, let's switch to the second topic. So uh, second topic is on network coding for ICN, CCN, all those information content centric uh, networks and which could also and which is also one of the main uh, fields where network coding can make sense. So we have two presentations, uh, one from Cedric and one from Mitoshi. So Cedric, if you want to come. Yes, yes, pin box. Just in between the lines. Thank Hello, you. does that work? Is it on? It was working a few minutes. Well, I think it is okay. Uh, yeah. So, well, thanks for inviting me to uh, to to participate in this. Um, uh, so, at first, the the original, I think, on the wiki, I don't know if it has modified, but it was talking about some paper that that we wrote about network coding and and ICN using a um, combination of those two uh, things to uh, uh, to do video uh, video delivery, and then uh, after. Talking a little bit. 
okay. After <laughs> after talking a little bit with uh, um, uh, Vincent and uh, and, uh, and people, I thought I was going to do a, a more of a, like kind of a description of what CCN is and and uh, uh, kind of describe it a little because it, it might be necessary uh, to provide a little background. So. Uh, how do I change the slides? You do it for me. Okay. So, uh, so there's a nice uh, research group uh, in the RTF as well that met that had an interim meeting on um, Sunday and a meeting yesterday, and uh, one of the uh, uh, RFCs it, it uh, produced, uh, RFC 7, uh, 7933, has like this kind of paragraph on, on network coding, and so I started. Uh, I mean, it was inserted in there because it, it's kind of a placeholder for a conversation for network coding and and. Uh, I see, and in that uh, discussion, and I guess later we can talk about how uh, those two research groups could uh, uh, synchronize on this. And then there's some papers on, on the topic that uh, we did. I think we did the first one with Mario Jose and uh, Dirk Trossen uh, in 2012, and then uh, there's some other papers. Uh, and this kind of those papers at the bottom are the one I'm going to talk about uh, today. So the uh, uh, Netcode CCN. Uh, from University of Bern, I'm not a co-author of that, but they uh, kind of took away, they ran away with the idea of this uh, 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 first uh, paper, and then uh, in return we took their code and we did this implementation of the uh, adaptive video streaming on top of Netcode CCN and kind of solved some of the uh, uh, implementation issues to do that. Uh, okay, so uh, well, uh, so I wanted to probably start with a little background on ICN, and, and ICN here in this context is going to be CCN. CCN stands for Content-Centric Networking. has been proposed, I think, in 2006, 2007 by uh, Van Jacobsen when he was at PARC, and uh, has been, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the NSF-funded four uh, future internet architectures, and uh, CCN slash... NDN. NDN was the name of CCN for, for that uh, NSF funding project. NDN stands for Name Data Networks. So uh, uh, that, that has been going for a while. And the key principle of it, it's that you have uh, uh, different uh, semantics of IP because everything is a request response uh, exchange. So, and, and for that ex handshakes, you have two types of messages. You have interest messages and data messages. You have two types of packets. And the interest carry the name. Uh, and the packet format is is on this uh, uh, picture, uh, and contain also some some uh, options and and uh, you know some parameters, and then the uh, the data packet returns uh, the content name as well and some uh, uh, signature information, security information, and then the payload as the data. Uh, and uh, so uh, the way uh, the, the network is architectured is that. So the, the client who wants to uh, uh, receive some data is going to send an interest with that name. And that interest is going to be received at an ICN router. And that router is going to have a uh, couple structures, data structures in the router. Uh, and uh, those data structures, there's a content store, and which basically is a cache. Uh, I, and then there's another table, which is the pending interest table. So that, uh, that's a list of the interests that have been received uh, and that are waiting for the data. And uh, so in the um, data structure that I mentioned before, in the packet format, the interest had a name, it didn't have a source. It didn't say where the source was. So that's kind of the intent here is to, to provide some, some level of privacy. Uh, however, because there's no indication of the source uh, of the packet, then you have to create a state in the router to route the data back to whoever was requesting it. So that's what that pending interest table does. It's the state, it's a transient state that you know, uh, says, well, I received the request for this data from that interface, so when I receive that data, I have to forward it on this interface. And, uh, and then you have the, the, the fib, which is gonna tell you, uh, when you receive the interest, you're gonna look up at the name, and then on that name, you're gonna do some uh, matching in that fib, uh, and then you have some divergences between different uh, so uh, protocols, some, some do a, an exact match, some do a longest prefix match. Uh, but uh, on, on the FIB, you, uh, you're going to do a, uh, well, actually, no, on the FIB, you're going to do a prefix match to find where, which, which, where you're going to forward that interest based upon the name. Uh, so uh, uh, 
I think that's what I'm, uh, yeah, so, so basically when you receive the interest, what's happening is, is there's a lookup to say, well, uh, for the name, is that data that is being requested in my cache? So you first do a lookup on the content store. And if that's negative, the data is not here. If the data is here, you return the data and you're done. If it's not there, then you, you add to your pending interest table a state saying that I've received a request from that interface. So for instance, in this case, I've received that request for that prefix for, from that interface uh, zero. And, and then you're gonna look at up uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the name and, and forward according to wherever interface is matching. Uh, let's go next. So uh, one of the thing is uh, the interest that can be uh, sent uh, so over multiple interfaces. And, and, the, uh, and one of the uh, advantage of uh, CCN is you request chunks and, and there's no session that you have to establish for this. You just send an interest for the name. You don't have to create first some kind of session. So you can use any interface that's available to you. So if you're on a wireless device, you can use uh, LTE and you can use Wi-Fi or whatever. And, and you can send interest on all these interfaces. Uh, so, but if you want to send, uh, uh, if for instance, uh, in this case here, you have a very simple example, that's the example from, from the paper from, from 2012, uh, where the client is gonna send some kind of interest, and then the router might uh, decide to send that interest onto two different uh, servers. Uh, because it does, it's not sure which one, because for that prefix, it has two routes that are listed. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, if uh, the uh, servers return the data, then uh, one, two servers are going to the two servers might return the data. Is that the case? One of those data is just going to be discarded, and the other one is going to be returned to the uh, client. Uh, the uh, idea of, of applying network coding here is relatively, it's, well, relatively, it's very straightforward. You just say, well, you know, if, if you request for a network coding segment instead of just the first segment that you want to get, then uh, the, the, those two servers might return different linear combinations. So you're still gonna uh, uh, discard one uh, in this case, because there's this balance of saying one interest and receiving one data. You cannot receive two uh, data packets for one interest. Uh, but the uh, uh, at least the, um, uh, the the two things that you're gonna keep at the the, the two packets you're gonna receive at the router in the middle uh, are gonna be different, and you can decode them, and you can already have the original uh, packet in there if you wanted to. And you, once the uh, client is gonna send the request for the second one, it's not gonna go all the way to the server; it's just gonna go to this uh, uh, router in the middle. So uh, and and uh, so. Let's go to the next slide. So the benefits, of course, is, is, is to combine the benefits of ICN, which is of this sessionless transport that you know connect directly to the content, uh, that supports some kind of uh, mobility in, in, in a more graceful way than having to set up some kind of session uh, that has this nati native multicasting uh, and that kind of take advantage of this ubiquitous caching. So that's kind of the benefits of ICN, but you add to this the benefits of network coding, which is this kind of asynchronous use of multiple interfaces, uh, that if you multicast an interest to multiple sources, uh, then whatever data is returned to you is not lost, but can be cached closer to the, the person who, to the client who made the request. And you can populate the cache faster if you have multiple clients requesting the same data. So you, you have uh, different scenarios, uh, you know, you can look at unicast scenarios or point to multiple point to multiple point to multiple point scenarios where you know in in every case there's some some benefit of the network coding and then uh of course uh you try to preserve the one interest one data flow balance of ccn so uh what happened then uh, the the, the um, there's this uh, net code ccn paper that was presented at uh infocom last year by by a team from university of burn uh and uh they kind of implemented it and, and, and wrote out some kind of specification. Uh, uh, our, our original paper was more of a position paper. And so uh, now you can request a credit segment and you don't have to specify a specific segment ID, you specify, specify that you want a credit segment. So you have some kind of way of, of uh, uh, indicating this uh, in, the, in the naming. Uh, the name carries kind of uh, that you request uh, that, well, there's a bit that tells you, you know, I, I allow for network coding, and in the name that is returned to you, you have uh, embedded the uh, coding vector as well as, uh, you know, the generation of, of, of the 
video. So you, you, if you have a specific file, you're going to cut it in different generations. Each uh, segment within the generations are going to be encoded together, and you do this so you don't have to wait uh, until the end of the file to decode everything. Uh, so, uh, and then you have to modify the procedure at the router, uh, of course, of the interest to, uh, to, uh, and, uh, and at the, uh, how you handle the data as well. Uh, and, and it's discussed in the paper. And I don't want to get into the details of it, but if you're interested, you can look at the papers. Uh, next slide. So, but the, uh, uh, the key difference, and that's a, a picture from that paper, is that the interests are not filtered out in the same uh, manner. Uh, so, for instance, uh, with the typical CCN, uh, if you have interests that are received, in this case, you have four interests that are being received on three interfaces. So uh, the first interest is received uh, on interface A, and uh, and actually uh, one of uh, uh, the idiosyncrasies of of uh, CCN is that they rename stuff. So like instead of cache, they call it content store. Instead of interface, they call it face. But uh, uh, which you know <laughs> uh, it's a little Orwellian if you ask me. But anyway, uh, uh, so the first one, the, the the first interest is received on interface. A and is being propagated. Both the, the top case is regular CCN, the bottom case is the coded CCN. So in both cases, it's the same. Uh, then you receive a new interest, and now it's on a new interface. Second interface or interface B. This one is not propagated because you already have one that's outstanding interest, and the data that's going to come back is going to be responding to both those interests. right? The third one comes on interface C. So then again, you're not going to forward that interest because the data that's going to come back also is going to satisfy this one. But then the fourth one, in the case of regular CCN, it's also being ignored because it's just a duplicate of the previous one. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's no action taken that. I mean, the, for, for the second and the third one, you put an entry in your pit uh, saying, you know, when I receive the data, I send it back to interface B and to interface C. But the, the fourth one, you do nothing in, 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 the, in the case of the red arrow. However, with the coded CCN, you, you forward it because now it becomes something that requests uh, new uh, degrees of freedom. So, uh, and, oops, I'm gone. A little bit yeah. long. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we took that code, we uh, merged it with like a dash implementation. And uh, we demonstrated some uh, some benefits of this, and particularly uh, seamless mobility. Uh, if if uh, and the way uh, so part of the implementation, what we show is that if you if you add more interfaces and you send the interest on those interfaces, uh, then the red adaptation can view the whole link between you and those multiple servers as one logical link to uh, the copy of the content and perform red adaptation on that logical link. So that's kind of a cool thing to have. And, and because you use network coding, you don't have, technically, you could connect to different servers, have different link to those different servers, and make different requests for different packets of, on those different servers. But you have to be cautious, because you would have to make sure you don't request the same thing on, on the different links, and you would have to make sure you request them at the right rate on the difference link. Uh, in this case, in our implementation, you don't do any of that. You just do the, the control. The red adaptation logic is that of dash, and is not modified, and everything underneath is transparent. And because you know network coding is inherently asynchronous, uh, uh, you, you 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 can just you don't have to worry about anything. So there's some little okay, <laughs> that's a hint to move on. <laughs> anyway, that's it for my talk. Uh, you know, thanks for for uh, hearing me. Uh, as far as what the next steps are, uh, th there has been some interest uh, on, on this domain. Uh, I was actually surprised by by uh, how, how much uh, there has been over the last years on uh, on, on that on that uh, paper we, we wrote a couple of years back. And uh, so so definitely there is some kind of people, th and there's another presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. On the same topic coming up, and uh, uh, so so that's good. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it, it, and if this research group would like to take on this work, I think that's a great idea. But uh, you know, it's just kind of offer it, uh, you know, to you guys as well. And uh, and also, uh, I'm more involved in the ICNRG group than in the uh, uh, NWC RG. Uh, but you know, so that so would be nice if they as well so to build bridge with that other community. Anyway, so you have questions or you have remarks or comments? Yeah. Thank you, Cedric. Yeah. Uh, I think we will take questions at okay. the end because now there is the second uh, presentation on the same topic. So we will uh, talk about those future steps at that time, if you don't mind. Well, so you have a question on this specific topic? No? We're all good? <laughs> OK. 
Right. No, it was clear. Thank you very much. Itoshi? Just wait. <coughs> So same topic, second presentation. <laughs> okay, so I'm Hitoshi Asaida from NICT, and uh, this work with uh, my colleagues Kazis and uh, Cherry Turetti in India. And this uh, paper was uh, accepted in uh, Infocom, so it's already presented in the uh, last uh, uh, Infocom conference uh, held in uh, Atlanta. So the title is Low Latency, Low Low Streaming Using in Network Coding and Caching. Next, please. So the motivation of this work is to fulfill the various requirements, especially for the target, which is a UHD level 4K or 8K delay sensitive video streaming. Delay sensitive means uh, really, really real time streaming. So the requirements we formulated were uh, low latency about 150, for example, 150 milliseconds for interactive communication. This 150 millisecond is defined in the ITUT recommendation. And uh, we definitely need to have a chance of the low packet loss to maintain high QoE. And of course, from the network perspective, efficient packet delivery to support a large number of receivers because uh, high quality or high bandwidth streaming, uh, if the large number of receivers uh, receiving the same content, then uh, the network will be consumed. So the proposal is L4C2, low latency, low loss streaming using in coding and caching. So what is L4C? The basic idea is uh, that we leverage CCN NDN features. And uh, because a CCN NDN can leverage the name-based date request and forwarding and uh, natively support multicast and multipass. And uh, um, we enable adaptive hop by hop data forwarding within an acceptable end to end delay. Acceptable end to end delay is, let's say, it's 150 millisecond. And the hop by hop uh, data forwarding is something like a fashion of the CCN and the NDN. So it's natively supported hop by hop data forwarding. And uh, so to fulfill the, this requirement, we use inner coding, which is actually London Media Network Coding, LNC, and also in network caching, it's uh, natively supported by CCN and NDN for Asian data recovery. And also, um, data recovery within an estimated acceptable link day. This acceptable link day is not an end to end delay. End to day, end delay uh, is requirement for the application. Acceptable link delay is something like, like a requirement for the calculation of the retransmission for the lost packets. And the data recovery based on the measured data loss rate. And uh, uh, to support these uh, functions, we newly defined the symbolic interest and the control interface. Because uh, the CCN and the uh, for the simplified reason, uh, so for the simplification the reason, uh, the regular, we, we call it regular interest. Interest must be sent to get the data, as uh, uh, Cedric mentioned. But uh, that regular interest may uh, cause some uh, uh, problematic situations I'll explain later. So we newly defined SMI and CNI. The, and SMI used for streaming requests including layer, layer information and the control interest is used for RTT measurement, notify redundancy level uh, for encoding and switching to uh, regular interest. So this is a system architecture. We make something like a separation from control plane and data plane. For the control plane, the user, consumer, send the interest, different kinds of interest. Symbolic interest, regular interest, which is defined by the uh, predefined pre CCN in, in the end, and control interest. For the data plane, uh, you can see the one video source, and you have a large number of consumers receiving the same content. And the video source can be uh, layered, and the layered encoding data, and uh, also the redundant coded data is transmitted from the source. And uh, uh, the intermediate routers can cache the content itself and also the coded data as well. So the receiver, uh, briefly I explained the situation. So the receiver 
when he receives the content and he detects some missing packet, then he may request the retransmission of, of the missing data. But if luckily you have the missing data is cached in the network, then the content can be, uh, can be uh, transmitted from the cache. But unluckily, if you don't have the uh, cached data, but luckily you have the coded data, then you may create the coded data inside the network and you, finally you retrieve the uh, complete packet. So the network coding is applied for each coding group, which consists of the k different original coded data packets. Encoding vectors are randomly selected from a uh, Gallo field uh, to power by a, and k is set to a constant value considering the waiting time to recover lost data. So this is uh, one of the core function uh, for estimating link conditions. Uh, the delta loss rate can be ca easily calculated because uh, we detect the sequence number and the network coding parameters stated in the data header. So the receiver can easily uh, calculate or uh, recognize the data loss rate. And, uh, but accept the link delay, it's something like hop by hop delay. This is a little bit difficult to measure the hop by hop delay. But basically the application itself is transmitted within 150 milliseconds. This is our assumption, but uh, if you receive the data, so let's assume that the, the source already uh, encoded the uh, uh, absolute time, <clears throat> sorry, absolute time. So he can recognize, okay, so this content uh, coming from a source uh, with a several uh, period, let's say uh, 100 millisecond or uh, 50 millisecond. So he has something like a Bastille budget. If he received the content from the source, and uh, he calculated that this takes uh, 100 milliseconds, then you have a 50 millisecond budget. And so that within the router, if this 50 millisecond budget can be used to encode uh, the, or, and decode the lost data, then you can use this 50 millisecond. This is what we call the, the timing some, uh, delay budget. So the, each router calculate and measure the, uh, the RTT between them, and uh, this, to, to make this kind of a, a measurement, we def define the control interest. This control interest can measure just a less one, like a pin. So each router has such kind of information. And uh, if you receive this uh, CNI, for example, router I now just send a, a CNI to router J, the router J respond uh, with uh, uh, the link delay between source and J. So he can recognize, okay, so from J to S, uh, the delay must be, let's say, DSJ. And the router I also informed, if he received the CNI from downstream, then he can send the total uh, delay from source to router I to the, his downstream neighbors. Then each router has uh, the knowledge about the budget. So um, I don't explain the very detail uh, today because of the, uh, because it takes time. So uh, we directly now uh, explain our simulation results. Uh, we, no, so. so this is a simulation we set up and uh, this is done by NDN Sim. And uh, we have a real time video rate, total 35 mega BPS. And this can be uh, reduced with the reduction of the layers. So 20, 10 and five mega BPS. And the interest data and the data packet size is 100 or 1024 bytes. And the acceptor end to end delay is 150 milliseconds. And the scenario is, is to investigate the user QOE using an existing QOE model and the comparison with state of the art for multiple data to be retrieved in CCN, which is proposed by in uh, uh, previous ICNP. So this is a result. So um, the green one is uh, this paper, and the red one is our L4C2. And uh, maybe it's better to see. So uh, thanks to the, sim the mixture of uh, CNI or regular interest and uh, symbolic interest, we can uh, strongly reduce the number of uh, uh, transmitted uh, interest traffic, something like a signal, because CCN just uh, or NDN just requires exact match for the receiving contents. So if we use something like a symbolic interest, then we can omit 
the burst or high late interest transmission. So we can uh, hardly reduce this, such kind of signal. And the left of side figure shows that uh, we uh, increase the normalized QOE comparing with uh, the uh, last ICNP paper. So that's all for the, our paper's uh, explanation. So this uh, slide just show, uh, this is something like my personal opinion that uh, I already sent to the mailing list. And uh, so uh, we may be able to contribute to various work in uh, this network coding research group. For example, potential work in network coding research group. I don't know, uh, all of you or many of you uh, can agree, um, agree with, to this uh, um, so, but uh, I think that, for example, describing a common research challenge is uh, interesting. So, what kind of uh, research should be done for network coding, in network coding, end to end network coding, end to end efficient, so on. And also, but they, uh, we can have a chance to describe a baseline scenarios, especially, for example, for network coding for ICN, CCN. As Cedric said, uh, we have a various maybe uh, research work for this. Uh, area and this domain. And then we can maybe discuss about in work coding, including the qualified the problem statement and introduce recent work, compare with RNC and other codes, investigate block coding versus sliding window coding approach. Uh, by the way, uh, our approach is just based on the block coding because of the com uh, simplicity. So we not, our future work is uh, related to the adaptation of the sliding window coding approach inside our uh, proposal. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. So I see that it uh, quickly goes into very specific details with all those interests specific to your work. Yeah, so it's very technical, very quickly. So, but anyway, thanks a lot for this presentation. So le let's talk a lot, a, a little bit about this uh, topic, network calling and ICN. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, Thomas Nicolaos uh, sent me an email. So he sent an email to the list explaining that there was this paper that um, Cedric mentioned about uh, netcode CCN available. And he sent me an email just to tell me that, okay, he couldn't join today afternoon, but he volunteers to take part into this activity and to contribute. So that's the first point. So the next point is that, okay, I, I think it would make sense since uh, there are at least three people interested and probably a bit more, we'll see, uh, into this uh, topic. It would be perhaps interesting to have the same approach as we had previously for the previous uh, topic, uh, satellite communications, that is to say, uh, trying to set up a small design team, a few people interested and volunteer to uh, contribute and uh, work jointly. So I hope that uh, you all <laughs> would like and uh, agree to work jointly on this topic? Well, that's the first question to you and sure, uh, sure. to you, Cédric. Sure, sure. Of Perfect, so that's a good point. And uh, then, uh, well, try to organize the ideas, organize the domain into uh, some uh, outline and filling this uh, internet draft outline progressively. That could be a, a way to move forward. Yes, Alison. So this is Alison Mankin, uh, IRTF chair. Um, I wonder if you're going to have some design teams, whether you might want to create a kind of a template for what is in a, design, a document that takes a certain aspect of FEC and then put some consistency across the documents. Um, because uh, there, there's probably some common, there's quite a bit of common ground in terms of describing why you're doing this and and what are the kind of components? Yeah, this is a good point. Yeah, we, we can try. Yeah. Good. So there is this uh, generic part for in this Linton draft that will be the same more or less for all uh, design teams subjects and then the specific part to the specific use case. Yeah, we can try to do something like that. Yes, good point. For the, for example, for the common research challenge, this doesn't uh, mean we uh, only concentrating the, for example, network coding for ICM or CCN. So, uh, so the, for example, this is my personal opinion, but the common, there are several common research challenges, including uh, ICN, CCN, satellite, wireless, and uh, other stuff. So there are a lot of architecture or there are a lot of uh, various or different uh, link 
layers or different applications. So the research challenge could be different. But we can summarize, for example, this for this domain, we can uh, we should address this kind of issue for this domain or for this kind of network condition, then we should address this. Kind. So the research challenge itself can be as, for example, this is my personal opinion, but can be as something like a single document. But for the baseline scenario, it's a little bit difficult to concentrate only for the one uh, general solution or baseline scenario that can, can be adapted to various network or various applications. So the baseline scenario, for example, we can form some uh, uh, design team, let's say design team for ICN and the uh, design team for satellite, I don't know. But so this is something like my personal opinion. Cedric, do you want to add something? No? Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I hope that there will be other people interested as well. Oh, Cedric, yeah. So, Cedric Kaji in Raya, I, I just want to say that I think this topic very interesting. And I, I will just want to mention that I could participate in, in many documents. Yeah. OK, perfect, perfect. There are many situations where it can make sense to have uh, this kind of uh, uh, architecture of solution for distributing content. Uh, on the list a few months, uh, one month ago, maybe we, we mentioned the possibility of having this approach for distributing content within trains, for instance. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, a good potential behind it. That's great. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. Let's switch to the next uh, presentation. First, uh, uh, I don't know if new people came and didn't sign the blue sheets. It's the Okay, so let's switch to the next uh, uh, topic. So other network coding potential use cases. Um, well, in the uh, agenda, there is this uh, presentation from Rolf. So I see that Rolf is uh, online on Miteco. Uh, unfortunately, and I need to apologize, I was not very clear and not clear enough with uh, Rolf on what was expected for uh, today afternoon. And in particular, I was not very clear in the fact that we were looking for existing solutions, more or less, on uh, different domains for applying network coding and coding. Uh, and therefore, what uh, he sent me was more on potential use cases where it could make sense to have coding, I would say, instead of having a presentation on existing solutions. So I don't see if you see what I mean, but uh, I, I will not go into the details uh, of this presentation. I will just quickly, briefly uh, mention what was inside. Uh, for instance, the fact that, okay, he, he, we have some slides, some content about uh, highly, uh, uh, well, high density sensor networks, let's say that this way. Uh, either for uh, CERN uh, particle collider, uh, experimental infrastructure, where you have a few, well, many thousands of sensors at the same place, producing a very huge amount of uh, uh, data uh, in a very short time frame and why it could make sense to have some kind of coding, but uh, for the moment, we don't know if it is the case or not. So that's uh, one potential use case that he, he identified. Uh, also this uh, use case where you have containers, each of them equipped with uh, uh, sensors that will produce uh, regularly uh, some data and why it could make sense to have uh, uh, coding. Then those two use cases related to uh, vehicles, either trains or uh, cars, that will communicate with one another and where also it could make sense to have uh, network coding. I'm sorry, but I go through them uh, very rapidly, as I said. And finally, this uh, domain where you have coding for content storage, uh, NAS or SAN or, those, or cloud storage. Okay, so but I don't want to enter 
into the details because I said the slides are not very well focused on what uh, I had in mind. So I, I apologize, Rolf. I don't know if you want to add a few words, uh, but I want to apologize with you. I was not very clear on, on what I asked you. So anyway, this is work in progress. If you know that uh, in some specific domains that were mentioned here, you are aware of uh, network coding applications, network coding experiments. If you have feedbacks, then please uh, tell us, and we will try to uh, go further into details next time. Rolf, anything to say? No? He told me that his network connection would not be very good, so I don't know if he, if he can uh, participate. Anyway, so let's switch. And uh, if you have, uh, if you want to say something, Rolf, you can come back later on. Okay, let's switch to the next uh, presentation from uh, Marie Jose. This is a joint presentation with uh, Brandon Williams from Akemai on uh, something that we mentioned on the list: this uh, generic, robust, low-latency tunneling system. Thank you. You have the floor. Um, oh, hi everybody! I hope you hear me. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to present. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, and I think Brandon also apologizes because he couldn't be there. So this is very recent work uh, that we started doing, uh, I would say the early part of that, maybe last year and going all the way yesterday afternoon. Um, and there is part of it which has use cases that relate a little bit to what uh, Benson just presented. Um, and also to uh, the presentation on ICN-CCN. But uh, this is actually looking at it from a more, uh, not network coding as a set of libraries to do coding, but how do we introduce network coding as an element in a toolkit to enhance performance in a network? So I know I don't have the slides. Uh, I cannot move the slides, so could you please get to the next slide? So there is some new use cases. I think we've heard about uh, on the list about NFV. We learn about uh, SDN. Um, and a lot of the work, if you look historically, uh, I, I, I think uh, Cedric to have mentioned our paper of 2012, uh, in past 10 years, actually, <clears throat> the, uh, the main focus um, of the FEC at the network layer have been very much for wireless and streaming video uh, with performance and then combined with uh, performance enhancing proxies, uh, proxy based forward error correction, but mainly for the wireless and streaming. But there's a lot of other use cases that are on the rise. Obviously, all the enterprise work that's being done on uh, overlay networks. Uh, the cloud computing, a lot of people understand the computing part of the cloud computing, but don't really get that the, there's a cloud and you have to get in and out of the cloud and keep performances there. And, and I would say uh, it, from the previous slide, uh, a previous presentation, there was this thing about the mobile fixed network, the airplane, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the multi-satellite, the trains. Uh, and this has some kind of a rebirth of this, I think in terms of some kind of an inter of the internet. So what we feel is that what is needed is some research and implementation of some flexible dynamic uh, application and policy-based mechanism. Uh, because we need to enhance the performance of these rising services beyond the traditional quality of service, which was essentially just prioritizing uh, services and allowing them to have enough bandwidth. Next slide. So, what we suggest is to look at some kind of a robust low latency tunnel. And what do we mean by that? And we would like to have a dynamic negotiation performance inside the tunnel. When the tunnel is established, instead of just being de facto, I'm going to send all my stuff there. Um, what is the what is the performance that this tunnel is going to give us? And should we use this one or another one? Should we use uh, some FEC or not? Should we use all kinds of other uh, performance enhancement through that tunnel? And I'm going to come back to this in the next slide. And to essentially define my end-to-end -end semantics from where I am at my application going to where I want to go 
and the other applications. Uh, we want it to be completely in user space. We don't want to be impacting things that are below us. Uh, there's a lot of issues now with middle boxes being introduced everywhere on the network. And, and I'm sure that you guys, some of you went to the TLS uh, meetings where there is issues with, with middle boxes. Uh, we don't want it to interact with crypto. We don't know where the VPNs are, and we don't want to deal with that either. And we do not want to have network termination hop by hop if we don't have to do it, because it's so complicated to restart everything and re, uh, redefine what is needed at the next hop. Next slide. So what needs to be negotiated? Well, we're inside this network coding uh, research group, so obviously um, that's the, the use of the FEC algorithm and the implementation we want to use. And those depend not only on technical issues. Uh, do I have, um, you know, what is my error rate? Is it bursty? Is it not bursty? But there's also legal constraints and requirements. There's a lot. There's patents in this field. There's software licensing. Do I have the right uh, legal rights to use this? Does my destination have the right to use this? So I think we want to be able to negotiate that. Obviously, there's this reliability requirements, which is central. So based on packet error rates and profiles, uh, I think it's not just the error rate, but also the burstiness. Uh, when we look at things that come from the physical layer, it has a tendency to be a little bit more uh, random because of the other implementation of FE set lower layers. But when you start looking at the network layer, there's actually a lot of burstiness and very long burstiness and your code has to be able to adapt to this. Do we need in-order delivery uh, for some applications? Yes. For some applications, no. Um, and it's it it actually relates this time to maybe the difference between uh, having video versus page load, for example. Uh, do we want to have basically to trade delay tolerance with reliability? Um, if we can't tolerate delay, maybe we can have a more reliable uh, system. This has been essentially the main uh, goal of uh, forward error correction for about 70 years. Uh, would we like to have uh, packet pacing uh, to maintain constant delivery rates? That actually helps also in the monitoring of the network. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, congestion control and fairness. Actually, this is a question. Uh, for example, do we need the protocols to be TCP aware. There is some network coding work that's been done that is TCP aware. There's some that is done that is not. And a big one for us is this microflow support versus muxing. Uh, and we would like to have the microflow to be independent from the tunnel protocol evolution. So if the tunnel itself evolu you know, evolves, uh, our flows that are within it should be untouched by it. Uh, obviously, uh, some of these are implementations, some of them are still research, and I think the whole set of this is actually a nice network research project. Next. Uh, <clears throat> so, actually, what exists and can be built upon, but obviously there's a growing number of FSC codes and protocols. Uh, the quick tunnel, it's not the quick tunnel codes, but the quick tunnel code. And I think Ian Sweat, who presents later, is going to talk about this. Uh, there's uh, some TAPS, there's concept uh, to uh, decouple application from uh, transport, which relates a lot to this. There's some new path aware networking research that has been proposed in this IETF. And there's other, and also, you know, related to congestion control, the SDN, but also uh, relating to what Cedric presented, uh, we gave some thought to how uh, this application, well, this implementation or this way of thinking of things could actually be uh, in embedded into an IC ICN uh, and CCN um, framework. And actually, if you think of publish response or data response, um, or query response, there's actually a way to do the same thing because, again, there is a negotiation. Next. So um, we feel that there's uh, 
next steps to do this. Um, there's been a lot of talk again on the um, on the list about architecture. Uh, there's many ways of looking uh, at architecture. I think in this case, it's more like a network architecture draft. And I think based on the num numerous uh, implementation of network coding inside networks, they could be an implementation draft on how to do this uh, within what is existing. And we would like to know if this is important work uh, for the future of network coding as part of the network coding performance toolkit. Uh, we feel it's important, but again, it's, you know, we're suggesting that to the, to the group because it's a bit out of the current scope. Next. And again, uh, so that's, I made this very generic because it's a very recent idea, but I would like to thank Vincent and Ian uh, for some of the talks that led to this. And of course, um, the people at Akamai who have helped uh, into some form, some development that helped us uh, focus our ideas in this. So that's about it. Okay, thank you, Marjorie. Um, I have a technical question, and uh, then we can continue with this uh, with those questions about what to do next. A uh, technical question is about the uh, use of uh, potential use of uh, in-network recording uh, feature. Do you believe that it will be that this tunnel will use uh, only end-to-end -end coding, or also it is necessary to have recording within the network? Do you have an idea of about it? Well, or not yet. Actually, not yet. Um, okay. But I think that in the idea of the microflow being independent, it actually doesn't prevent this microflow to be re-encoded at one point. And again, uh, for I think for the moment we looked at end-to-end -end semantics, but I think uh, we could think about it also in what happens if um, there there could be. I think there could be some in-network, but we haven't really thought about it yet. Okay, and the side of microflow, I don't truly really understand what you mean by okay, microflow. Okay, so yeah. what, what, we think, what we think is, do we want our tunnel to be destination-based where we mux everything into it? Or do we want the tunnel also to be aware of what are the specific sessions that are within it? So the microflow is the specific session versus the whole mux thing. Okay, I understand now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, those are well, there are many important uh, research topics in this uh, uh, potential activity. Very interesting questions. Um, so the, the the key question I think is uh, whether there is a critical mass to uh, address this topic as well, in addition to the previous two ones, or not. That's uh, one of the key points. But I see that there is uh, support and strong support, I would say, from Akimai. Uh, uh, I guess. Uh, that and I think it's a good implementation. Well. Actually, it's a potential good implementation uh, to be included with Quick, but I will let Ian talk about that. Okay, so potential also with Quick, good. And these uh, among people who are present today afternoon, uh, are there anybody interested? Is anybody interested as well on this topic? I am as far uh, without my chair at, but uh, I am also in, in, interested, but. Uh, who else? We'll go to the list anyway, so you can think about it and answer later on <laughs> if you prefer. I see nobody. Uh, maybe Victor? Victor, you have the floor. Thank you, Marie. Uh, uh, she said, uh, this is interesting. <clears throat> Just a quick question. I think it has uh, potential and interest in the group. We'll see uh, on the mailing list as well. Um, Something interesting that I saw on, <clears throat> on your brief presentation is that the um, the end-to-end, -end, the application level component, the uh, the part where you express the various uh, um, performance or otherwise QoE requirements, that's clearly something that we did not, as you said, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, out of what we initially thought in the charter and, and so on, but uh, I don't think that would be uh, uh, bad to actually have uh, as a research topic. Uh, in other words, in, you know, in, sh in short, I think it's interesting. Uh, and we haven't uh, actually uh, 
discussed or, or uh, considered this uh, topic yet. So, uh, um, yeah, I, so I, think, the, I think as yeah. the application uh, become much more varied, I think there's going to be a lot of these things that's going to pop up. Yeah. Uh, you know, if yes. you remember, no, when no, we started, again, it was very good. Yes, I, I agree. I think this is interesting. We haven't uh, we haven't discussed that. Uh, clearly, it has implications. In, you know, whatever the application wants to do or uh, wants from the uh, actual uh, from the network service that uh, that would be made possible by this tunnel that has the uh, uh, network coding and other uh, under under mach other machinery under the hood. That would be interesting, and the implication of what out of what the application requests because application normally is agnostic about what is it a network coding is it some other you know mechanism under the hood uh, it is important that uh, at that point of inflection at the interface between application and the network is uh, what are the implications between the requests and and the uh, mechanisms that can provide that kind of service so i, I think that's good interesting Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Nicola. Ah. We cannot hear you, Emmanuel. No, still no, no sound. No, no, we cannot. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you can send the question to the mailing list. I'll respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it okay now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's okay. Thank you. No, okay. So it's a question from both. Uh, finally, it's not only me. It's uh, me and Nicola. Um, the question is: uh, it it sounds like more problem of traffic engineering than a problem of network coding, and. Uh, I don't see, uh, you presented several solutions, but it was much more related about network engineering, network traffic engineering, rather than uh, network coding itself. So uh, okay, I, I, agree. I, I agree with you. Um, and that's what I said, it's actually to put network coding inside a toolkit for traffic engineering, if you want to put it this way, or network coding inside a toolkit of yeah, I would say more network engineering. I agree with you. This is not network coding research. And I actually said that this is not looking at codes. This is looking at codes inside an infrastructure for traffic engineering, which I think is engine is networking research, maybe more than network coding research. But I think because it implies the use of network codes in uh, maybe different use cases and everything. I think it is related to this group. But I agree with you. We will not, this work will not lead to new network codes. It could lead to new, maybe encoding and decoding uh, requirements uh, that could be sent back to the coding people. But uh, yes, yes, I completely agree with you. This is not network coding research. This is network research. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where there's a link also with what we, when we wanted to speak in our draft on the deployment of network coding techniques in satellite system, for example, we have the question on the inter in interaction with a virtualized work. And basically, I, I don't know if maybe if we speak about lots of subset of functions that need to be interconnected, the, maybe it's more interesting to, to try to target more uh, uh, working groups such as the service function chaining working group or network function virtualization working group where basically they have use cases yes, on deployment. because there are other groups working on tunneling and stuff like that and I think they uh, we have to see what they are doing before well diving. I think I think that's part of the that's part of the work um, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that this is you know none of, none of these things is um, independent on its own but in any case it, it I think if if the group thinks this is not interesting, you know, I, I don't mind. I, I think uh, I, I don't know. I, I'll ask Brandon to support this this remark. But if this is not interesting for network research, we can actually take it to transport. Yeah. Maybe we can 
uh, give the floor to uh, Brandon, who's waiting. Nicola, if you don't have anything else to add. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, Brandon, we are listening to you. Okay, can you hear me? Um, yep. The, 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 the point I wanted to make about the network engineering aspects is that I think uh, what we're really focused on are the ways in which application of the codes at the network level actually directly impacts the net network engineering. Um, there, there tend to be a lot of tunable parameters related to how the codes are applied that have a direct impact on the network quality and the quality of experience for the application. The, the tunings that are appropriate for real-time video will tend to be different than the tunings that are appropriate for uh, data transfer and, and that sort of thing. And, and the idea is that for really effective application of network coding, we somehow have to take into account the impact that it has on uh, the network engineering and sort of the interrelationship between the tunable parameters for the network codes themselves um, and uh, the quality of the network experience. That's really the, the focus here, not so much on network engineering overall um, uh, via protocol, but rather negotiation around the aspects of the codes themselves that have an impact on the network uh, engineering. OK, thank you. Um, Nicola, you? No, I think he has no question anymore. Um, we are two minutes late. Yes. This is okay. Ah, that's, okay, yes. we, we'll listen to you if you, uh, you want to add something quickly. Yes, it's just that it is much clearer now and we we understand the need for the... Um, at the application at level. At the application level. Yeah, I think on it's, QoE experience. <laughs> Not on the network, that's why uh, we were a bit confused. That's now the, the link with the TAPS working group is clearer mm. in the slides and also that's why we understand better in the problem is the interface between what you have, the network coding solutions that you have, and what is actually deployed at the moment at the application level, mm -hmm. and if we could do more. And that's also the link with the quick presentation that will come after the, the it's mm -hmm. clearer now. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, okay thank you. Anyway, we will continue on the list. I think we need to make progress and switch to the next presentation now. So thank you to everybody for your contributions. So, Hello, so my name is Jonathan Echar, so I will talk about uh, coding technique to improve the speed of uh, eraser codes, so note that uh, some parts of this work uh, have been patented. So next slide. So before giving you some details, I will give you the use case and the context of uh, this coding technique. So next slide. So just a brief reminder, so uh, Suppose you want to send some packets over a network to another node, so you want to protect them uh, by adding some extra packets, so you generate some liner combinations. You send all these packets, and if you have losses, you reverse the operations to rebuild uh, your missing source packets. So that's why we need to use the finite field to uh, perform these liner combinations. So uh, if you're interested, uh, Planck wrote a really good uh, technical report about uh, finite field arithmetic applied to uh, eraser codes. So it's a good entry point if you are interested. So next slide. So now the problem with uh, finite field arithmetic is the operations are complex. So the solution is to move away from this structure to go into an, uh, another structure called a ring where operations like multiplication are much easier. So it's fast. So we use fast transforms to move all our field elements into a ring element, a bigger ring. We perform the multiplications inside this uh, ring structure, and then once we get the results, we go back from this ring to the field. So it's a known technique based on ring decomposition, so it's not new. What we did actually is uh, the definition of new transforms. So next slide. For the ring transforms, so basically you have uh, this operation to do, so the vector represents your data, so you have thousands of bytes of data, so that's your packets, and you have a, a matrix. So the first thing you need to do is to transform your data. <clears throat> so this transform must be fast because you have a lot of data. So the next transform, next slide, uh, 
uh, is about uh, generator matrix. So this transform doesn't have to be fast because that's, that's a few elements, but the elements you get must be uh, well chosen. And when we move from the field to the ring, actually we move into a bigger ring. So we have a choice to do. So that means uh, one field can have several representation in this ring. And by using this, we could reduce the complexity. I will explain later. Next slide. So you perform the multiplication in this ring. Okay, so you get ring element. And now we apply the reverse transform to go back from the ring elements into field elements. Next slide. Okay, so the first transform you could use is called the embedding transform. So uh, it was uh, described by uh, Ito in 1989. Okay, so it's very fast to transform finite field elements into ring elements and back. And additionally, we added two other transforms. So the first is called parity transform. So uh, like embedding transform, it's very fast to transform finite field elements into ring elements and back. And the most important is this sparse transform. So this is the transform applied to the matrix. So uh, it is very efficient to reduce the complexity because uh, it will choose uh, the good element into uh, inside the ring. Uh, so next slide. I don't want to... to uh, I'll give you some details. If you want to do some details about these transforms, you could read uh, this paper. So we presented. Uh, so here is the final scheme. So you applied a special transform to your vector that data, and you applied another transform to the generator matrix. So just to give you an idea of uh, um, how the sparse transform can reduce the complexity. Let me give you an example. So next, next slide. When you have a generator matrix, um, it is composed by field elements. So a well-known technique is to convert this matrix into binary matrix where each entry represents a XOR of a part of a symbol. So on the left matrix, you have the, the, this unstructured matrix. Uh, it represents all the XOR you need to uh, perform the operations inside the field. Now, it's if you move from this field to a ring, you get the uh, right matrix, okay? So the first thing uh, you see is you have less source, so less entries, so you have less operations to do. And then if you look well, the 12 elements are composed by cyclic uh, diagonals. So that's an important thing to optimize uh, the, the, the coding operation. So, you, okay, that's all. So now we implemented our method and compared our codec to uh, the fastest implementation we know. It's called ISA-L. It's uh, developed by Intel. It's open source and it's a fully assembly library. Uh, So operations, so it works on Intel, ARM, anything you want. In, uh, it allows also the, the use of uncommon fields like the GF64 because it's not possible using other techniques like uh, lookup tables uh, with uh, this, this field. And uh, this field is, uh, is very fast and uh, also uh, provides good uh, capacity corrections. So we test it inside uh, our uh, Tetris uh, code and uh, it has good performances, so, so it's cool. And uh, I'm done, if you have questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, it's great because uh, 
you could have made a very complex uh, presentation with a lot yes. of math. It's tricky to, <laughs> to talk about that, yes. <laughs> and the result is, in fact, uh, quite uh, easily understandable, and we really get the points. Uh, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Yeah. Uh, yes, Cedric Hadji in Ria, just a basic question. Uh, you go from a field to a ring, do an operation, do you, and then you go back to the field? Yes. So the point is to uh, just to be faster and the, the operation is isomorphic? Yes, uh, uh, yes. So not all operations are isomorphic, that are, that are homomorphic most of the time. Uh, yes, and that's, 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 that's the goal, yes. And why you don't stay in the, in, in the, in the ring? ring? Yes. Uh, because uh, when you transform the data from a field into a ring, uh, you have bigger uh, data, actually. Because your ring is bigger, so you have to represent it with uh, more data. That's why you need to go back. And uh, actually, uh, the transform just adds some redundancy. So the parity transform is just a XOR of all your monomes of your, of your, of your field elements. Okay. That's why you need to go back. Thank you. Uh, Martin Peterson, so uh, I think uh, very interesting uh, stuff. Well, one question I had was this transform, is that included in these benchmarks or is that, so do you do the transform, then the operations? It, it, it is included, I, it okay. is included, yes, of course, yes. And and the transform, is that also an XOR or, or as you say it expands the elements a little bit? Yeah, so, so if I have a gigabyte file, what would be my... Yeah, actually, uh, can you go back to the transform slides? Uh, the previous the previous when I described yes so the embedding transform is just to embed your um, your field element into a ring element so that means you do nothing okay okay so it's fast <laughs> and the, the reverse transform you actually need to XOR all the elements okay for all the, the last part of, of, of your ring element into the the, the other uh, field elements so and the other uh, transform parity is the opposite. So the first, when you go from the field to the ring, you, you, you just had a parity bit, actually. And the reverse transform is just removing this bit, okay? So can you go back to the other slide, the next slide? Yes, this one. So depending on how many uh, packets you have and you want to generate, you will use the embedding of the parity, but they are very fast. And okay. they are described in the paper. If you want, I can send you. If you, if you. Yeah, I, I mean, it reminds me a little bit of some work some people did on something called optimal prime fields, where they also need to do a mapping before and after the uh, uh, the the, the uh, encoding. I was just wondering if it was included because I know this ISL implementation also that they are also really fast, right? Yes. So I agree. So it's impressive that you are managing to outperform them by that much. Right. Thank you. Yeah. It looks magic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are running a little bit late, three minutes late, so I, I will ask you a question later on. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jonathan. So uh, I forgot to introduce, we move to the second part of this uh, afternoon's session on end-to-end, uh, -end, on coding techniques. So that was for the uh, implementation part. Now I, I, will, I will have a presentation on, um, well, sliding codes. Why should we use them and when? And then we will continue with the presentation on quick and uh, FEC codes and some experiments that could be done in this domain so for the future works. So I will move to the pink box. OK, so this is a presentation that I made in part at previous meeting at uh, TSVW working group, but with new results and new stuff. So it's uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that we didn't try to patent anything. because it will experience a different loss model. And then you do FEC decoding, you will construct the flow, and your goal is to achieve a specific target quality. So that's one of the key uh, criteria. Each uh, receiver must uh, achieve a certain target quality. So you have several parameters, this loss model that will differ from between the various receivers. You also have this very important parameter, which is the latency budget, the FEC latency budget that you can afford for FEC operations and coding decoding. 
If a lost packet cannot be recovered within this latency budget, then it will be lost forever. Uh, this latency budget does not consider any other source of latency. So propagation time, for instance, is not inside. It is uh, out of scope. And then, of course, we want to compare several physicals. So the intuition, very uh, basic intuition, with block codes, you are constrained by this uh, block creation time. So if we have an isolated packet loss, then it can take time to recover from this packet loss. With uh, sliding window codes, with this continuously sliding encoding window that slides over the data sets, then you have more opportunities to repair uh, lost packets more rapidly. So that's the key idea, the key intuition. Now the question is, does it work or not with other types of packet losses? So once again, uh, what can we expect from the use of sliding window codes? Well, uh, we can expect lower uh, FEC-related latency for the reasons that I just mentioned. But we can also expect, and this is still on intuition, uh, improved uh, robustness. Why? Well, for two reasons, essentially. Because um, uh, the sliding window will overlap with one another, so it will potentially uh, be a good asset in case of long packet losses bursts. So that's one of the reasons. And the other reason is uh, a consequence of the first one. If you have less latency with this scheme, then you can potentially accommodate larger encoding decoding windows. So once again, you will gain from this point of view. So this is the uh, a few more words about the experimental setup. So we compared the RLC, which is this uh, sliding window that we are proposing to TSVW working group. Very basic one, very basic solution. Nothing new inside. And we compare it with rich element codes with, uh, that are ideal codes uh, with uh, small uh, blocks at least. But those are ideal block codes. And we also included Raptor uh, code comparison. Raptor code comparisons, unlike uh, rich element, are far from ideal especially when you are considering small blocks, which is the case here. So you need to set up a few tricks. You need to uh, artificially divide uh, packets into sub-packets or symbols into sub-symbols in order to artificially increase the number of uh, uh, symbols per block, so going to uh, larger blocks. So it's a trick. It's tricky. It is described in the RFC describing uh, Raptor, but you have to do that. So the experimental setup is uh, similar to what I presented uh, just before. So you have this uh, CBR uh, transmission channel, which makes sense for the use case that we are considering. With FreeGPP, we are considering constant bitrate transmissions. So in this case, you have 10 packets per, oh, sorry, uh, 100 packets per second, uh, constant bitrate transmissions. You have this target quality. We don't want to have more than one, uh, well, 10 out of power minus three, uh, packets missing after FEC decoding, so that target quality. We have this loss model, which is also a very important parameter, and then we have this latency budget, the amount of time you can afford to doing encoding, decoding operations. And in that case, we consider two types, uh, two values, a quarter of a second and half a second. And then we want to measure in the first step how much repair traffic we need to achieve this given target quality, 10 plus minus 3 after FEC decoding, uh, given the loss model, uh, given yes, given the loss model, given the target, uh, the FEC latency budget. So, what is the additional repair traffic you need to inject? And when you inject that repair traffic, of course, you will reduce the source uh, application traffic uh, in a very mechanically. Uh, I don't have time to go too much into details, but the way it's implemented must be considered. Uh, especially with block codes, because uh, depending on whether you have a single output queue at the FEC code or two queues, it will differ in practice. So just a few words about it. Let's consider a block code. If you have a single output queue at the FEC encoder, it means that you put in that queue all the uh, source packets as they arrive in this queue. And then when you do FEC encoding, you put all those repair packets inside this queue. And then you, once again, you will 
continue to enqueue source packets. So since you are considering uh, constant bitrate transmissions, it means that the traffic shaper that is, that is behind this uh, queue will have to, um, uh, will generate uh, a lot of, well, gen uh, will, sorry, will uh, generate a, bu uh, a burst of, not a burst, but uh, will send uh, a sequence of repair packets followed by source packets, and then repair packets followed once again by source packets. And some source packets will be delayed because of that. So if you have a single output queue, it will be the res uh, that will be the result. If you have two queues, one for source packets, one for repair packets, then the traffic shaper will serve alternatively one flow, one uh, queue, and then the other one, and you will have this uh, mixed uh, transmission, source repair, source repair, source repair, in that case. So that's important to take into account. We also uh, focusing on 3GPP uh, use cases, which means that mobility needs to be taken into account, and 3GPP has produced uh, loss models for taking into account mobility. So typically, uh, basically, you have two types of uh, receiver. One is a uh, passenger of a vehicle, and the other one is pedestrian. If you are considering a pedestrian, this pedestrian will remain behind an obstacle for quite a long time because it doesn't work for so fast. So it ends up in having two different, completely different uh, types of loss models. As you can see in this figure, on the top, you have this uh, vehicle passenger with uh, which, uh, well, you will see uh, isolated packet losses more or less. And in the second uh, case, you will have those long bursts of packet losses. So this is also uh, something interesting, taking into account the official uh, loss models. I will uh, go directly to this uh, slide. So this slide uh, represents the amount of repair traffic you need in order to achieve the target quality 10 plus minus 3. Depending on the uh, uh, mobility scenario, depending on the loss model you are considering, and for the various cuts. So the, the y-axis represents this required traffic, repair traffic overhead, so the lower the better, of course. And if you look carefully, you will see that, uh, well, sliding window cuts are always, always much better, significantly better than the other uh, block uh, cuts, even the, uh, even Ritz Solomon block cuts. Raptor are well behind all of that. So that's the main achievement. So it really makes sense. Then if you look more carefully, you will see that some of these scenarios uh, cannot be addressed in a reasonable way with a reasonable amount of repair packets. Uh, this is the case for the worst uh, scenarios for the pedestrian use case. Uh, well, having uh, several hundreds of uh, re additional repair traffic is not reasonable. So. Uh, since we are considering a single source, a single data flow, you need to make a choice. Now that you have the results, you can make this choice. You need to choose the target uh, code rate, the amount of uh, repair traffic you, m you can accommodate. This is one way to say that. The other way is to select the channels that you want to support. So both uh, questions are more or less equivalent. And then from this, you can follow, you can uh, measure the actual latency that you can experience at a receiver. So very br quickly, I don't have so much time left. These, those figures uh, are for the final uh, situation. You have a single lot of flow with a specific latency budget, half a second in that case, with a specific uh, amount of repair traffic, 50%, so code rate one, uh, two thirds, sorry, in that case. And then you measure the experience latency at a receiver with this flow, depending on the scenario, mobility scenario. And what you can see is that uh, with RLC, uh, very good receivers, the, the one on the left, on the left curve, for instance, 1%, 5%, those good receivers will experience a very low latency, uh, even if it is dimensioned so as to accommodate up to 480 uh, milliseconds uh, at most. So that's a good point, and uh, Reed Solomon uh, will not uh, succeed, uh, well, does not compare so well in that case. Yes, it is fast. This is the uh, next question. We do not implement uh, our codes the way Jonathan did, 
So this is far from being the fastest FEC codes you can imagine, uh, codex you can imagine, but still it's uh, significantly faster than uh, Raptor codes, for instance, and more or less the same as uh, with uh, Ritz Solomon codes. So to conclude, yes, it makes sense to use sliding window codes. We experimented with those RLC codes for a simple codes, but you can imagine all the types of uh, sliding window codes it will be more or less the same results. We focused on most cast broadcast communications, but you can uh, have same uh, or similar benefits with uh, unicast communications as well. So that's all. Uh, I'm open to questions. Yep. Stanislav Akamai, did you use uh, Raptor RQ or uh, Raptor? No, RQ? we use the Raptor that are in the standard. So those Raptor uh, are, well, those are the, the old Raptor uh, uh, solution. Okay. Raptor Q are not in the standard. Okay. But performance could be better. Before, right? Performance could be better in terms of, uh, well, compared to Raptor, but still there will be more or less, uh, well, there will be more or less similar to that of Ritz Solomon, just behind Ritz Solomon, perhaps, or almost the same. But uh, th the idea of uh, comparing with Ritz Solomon code and individual code is really to, to, to add the best uh, solution possible with block codes in that case. Uh, I did not have time to mention, but the block codes typically are around 10, 20, less than 10 packets per block. So, oh, I see. Yeah, Marie-José. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is those codes are obviously based on convolutional codes that were done at the physical layer. So do they have the same um, capabilities or the same features? So your decoding, for example, it's is it based on a convolutional decoder? No, we we are, we, we have a, a sliding window code. So I know you don't like convolutional terms, so I get rid of this. Uh, adjective hat <laughs> in our document, in our presentation. So uh, what we're doing is just uh, uh, solving this linear system in the traditional way. No okay. difference. Okay. Uh, and the other question is being, again, going back to the word that we're not supposed to use, uh, convolutional codes, uh, have you thought of like other types of convolutional codes? Um, the ones that you puncture, the ones that, you know, the, like the punctured codes that you can actually uh, use to have uh, different rates from the same code or things like that, or it's just right now just a sliding window? Uh, we consider the most simplest uh, solution. Uh, so no puncture, no, nothing specific. Well, the, 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 exactly the, the well, uh, the RLC uh, codes that we are considering are exactly the ones that we specify in the uh, associated internet draft Okay, no, it's fine. I just was wondering where your research was. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yes. Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, uh, Vincent. This is great. Um, very interesting. I think we need more of this you know, research uh, <clears throat> results and uh, discussions uh, clearly uh, very useful for uh, lessons learned and uh, moving on with uh, research. So just a quick, uh, very quick question on uh, on this comparison. Obviously, uh, you know, with FEC, you have a fixed uh, uh, coding scheme with a fixed uh, coding rate, meaning the amount of redundancy is uh, fixed but uh, with RLC, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, uh, different protocols have different ways of, uh, it, was it uh, dynamic, uh, adapting to the loss of the channel or not? Or I'm trying to see how you can actually have uh, some comparison between uh, the different uh, uh, adaptation or, or what or lack of uh, mechanisms inside each of the protocols. Uh, obviously, the uh, uh, the Raptor codes are rateless, so they keep sending until you get it. Yeah, we are not considering adaptation dynamic aspects here in this case for sure. Mm -hmm. This is a multicast broadcast scenario, so you have a single flow, 
and uh, you have to uh, decide in advance what uh, we want to use in terms of uh, code parameters. So there is no possibility to adjust it. Uh, well, we are not considering a dynamic adjustment of those parameters, code rate, for instance, uh, during the session. Uh, it does not make any problem to change it if you have uh, unicast communications and feedback, a feedback flow that will tell you what is the uh, network uh, situation, network conditions. If you have that, you can do that is very easily with uh, RLC codes, with uh, those kinds of FEC codes. Mm -hmm. Nothing is fixed in advance. You need a new repair, you generate it, you send it. You don't need it, you don't repair, you don't generate it, and that's all. So all of this is uh, our uh, side questions that are not considered in this work, where we right. essentially and only wanted to compare uh, block versus uh, sliding window codes. But uh, yes, in right. practice, if you have uh, unicast communications, as in Tetris, we can do that. But right. Uh, so that, yeah, th this is good. So it, it, uh, that's good that you confirmed that it was indeed the same scheme of fixed uh, Co uh, coding rate. So that means it's indeed apples to apples. This is good. Yeah. We, we are running late. I'm sorry. We are 10 minutes late. Good. So Thank I you. prefer to give the floor to uh, Jan immediately. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name is, can you hear me? Okay. My name is Ian Sweat. Uh, I'm going to talk about quick FEC. Um, I want to call out one thing about, uh, actually, how many of you are familiar with the quick effort at um, IETF? Okay. Oh, okay. So enough that I won't go into it too much. But um, quick is a transport built on top of UDP. It's designed to be encrypted always um, because it's built on top of UDP and not TCP. The opportunity for FEC uh, is more promising than you know most TCP-based transports. And I think that probably is sufficient for, for what's in the slides. Um, we did a V1 of FEC. Um, it was in the original design. Um, it, you know, we, we tried experimenting with it in, in various ways, um, but the, the core foundation was it had a single, single XOR recovery packet. So you would have a block of a certain size, and every once in a while you would like rotate blocks, um, and you would either spit out an XOR recovery packet at the end of the block or not. Those are basically the two ways you could do it. So, um, and you could end up end a block prematurely. So if for some reason, you know, you entered quiescence and you didn't have anything to send, you could just end a block um, and, you know, have an XOR that only covered, say, two packets instead of 10, if that's what you want to have. Um, so it's built into the transport as a core feature. It was in the core framing. Um, and yeah, it recovered at a packet level. So it wasn't, um, it was kind of outside the, the crypto envelope. Uh, so. The main issue with it is packet loss on the internet, at least in our use cases for unidirectional um, unicast traffic actually is highly correlated. Um, so 70% of our FPC packets, even when um, there were losses to repair, did nothing. Uh, because we had no way of generating more FPC uh, in our scheme. And there was no way to resend the exact same quick packet um, to repair enough holes that like then the FPC packet could be used. Uh, because in Quick, uh, the pa packet sequence number is actually also used as the initialization vector in the crypto. And so it always must continually increase. Uh, because if you reuse the initialization vector in crypto, everyone becomes very sad and uh, you leak your key. Um, so uh, so anyway, so so this this particular flaw turned out to be uh, a sufficiently large problem that it it actually turned out to be for HTTP traffic better to just send a random packet like uh, what we do in tail loss probe for TCP uh, than it was to send an FEC packet because so often like the thing you sent was just useless. Um, yeah, and the fact that it was integrated in the core transport really uh, caused a lot of programming headache. I mean, I think we probably spent um, close to two developer years. Uh, trying to make it work uh, with different experiments. So we ran experiments where we just ran it at a fixed rate. We ran it at a rate that was um, half of the congestion window under the theory that you would never want to bother with FEC and wait an entire extra RTT. Um, and we ran one with which basically just replaced a aggressive tail loss probe uh, with a, a four error correction packet. And in all cases, 
it was just strictly negative or it turned out to be, um, it was slightly positive in a few cases, but in the cases it was positive, you could just send any random packet that hadn't been acknowledged and it was equally good. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, but now we know, we learned a lot. Um, next slide. So this, this turned out to be the, we found this out after we ran all these FPC experiments. We should have gathered this data first. So we gathered a bunch of data early on that was what quick packet loss would have looked like on the internet if uh, we weren't actually sending any data. And it turns out that's not super representative of like what it looks like when you're actually running a transport uh, over the internet. So when we weren't sending any data, like it did kind of look like IID approximately. It wasn't too far off. Um, but when you're actually using the network, um, at least to, to some extent, you know, whether it be search or otherwise, uh, this is the, the CDF you end up with. So um, you can see that about 30% of the time, uh, the packet loss distribution, oh, I should say, this is within an RTT. So this is, if you're familiar with TCP, the concept of a loss epoch, uh, like when you go into recovery. So this is how many packets were lost from the first packet that was lost um, to an RTT later. So it's, it's, not a, it's not true burst size, uh, but commonly these did actually arrive in bursts all the time. Um, so, and especially since we're considering approximately half an RTT as our, a, you know, a coding length or, a, you know, a window length, um, then these really started to play, to play in. So, you know, around 45% were in two packets and, um, you know, there's still quite a bit of energy at the tail of around eight. So, you know, maybe like by the time you get to eight packets lost in a single RTC, you're, what is that, around 90%? So, um, it's fairly correlated. I guess one is the most popular number, but it turned out two was like almost as popular. So, uh, next. So um, the current things that we've been thinking about is, you know, we learned from the first time, okay, this tail loss probe thing should work. It should be possible to send a packet and have it be useful no matter what. And if it's an FEC packet and there was only one outstanding packet, it would immediately recover. And if that wasn't sufficient, we would at least A, learn something, because it would generate an acknowledgement that would cause us to know what to send, and B, we, we wouldn't have wasted that packet. So it should be still possible to use possibly something like a sliding window code um, to only generate a packet at the, at the tail when you enter quiescence uh, for web applications. That should still be a valuable concept. Um, we haven't done the work to do it, but um, yeah, it, it potentially could be other useful for other applications that are sensitive to tail latency. Uh, Real-time communications like RTP for WebRTC uh, seem like an obvious use case. We've started to look into doing WebRTC on top of QUIC. Um, WebRTC, I think currently the most advanced scheme that is standardized or semi-standardized is a, um, a matrix of XOR forward error correction packets is, is the last draft uh, called Flex FPC. Um, apparently it works reasonably well, um, but I haven't really evaluated, but it kind of uses this matrix to deal with the fact that um, losses are sometimes correlated. So uh, you can kind of, as long as you don't lose two packets in the same row or column, like you're okay, essentially. Um, and oh, one thing about our, particularly WebRTC and, and all of this, um, we really need something that's fast enough that especially the decode can uh, happen on a relatively constrained device, i.e. a phone. I mean, it doesn't have to be the world's oldest phone, but if you can't run on an iPhone, then um, in practice, that's that's probably not going to be widely acceptable because a huge portion of our traffic is from iPhone and, and Android. Um, and then the last idea um, is a quick tunnel. So this kind of goes on what Marie was talking about. Um, in quick, you can't actually terminate the transport without terminating crypto, uh, which is great on a variety of levels, but it means something like a performance enhancing proxy is like literally impossible on the transport layer. Um, but there might be a possibility of using FEC tunnels as a replacement for uh, you know, a performance enhancing proxy in cases when you know that some por sub portion of a network um, has available bandwidth that you can use. So it doesn't have to be end to end. It could be you know, a tunnel in the middle that's in a provider's network, maybe from where they normally would install a performance enhancing proxy to the wireless head end or something. I don't know. Um, I mean, I, we, so any of these use cases sound potentially interesting. Um, and you know we have some active development in the in the latter two for like applications and the first obviously HTTP where um, you know Quick is around seven percent of the internet right now so that's like a thing um, you know so that there's a lot of deployment there so uh, you know 
any any help from this group in you know advising or uh, suggesting experiments that should be run or the willingness to run experiments because all of the code is open uh, would be welcome. Yeah, Jeff. thank you. We have seven minutes left, so time to take questions. Yes. Uh, Martin Peterson, so uh, on the performance thing, I think you will find no issues. So there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years, and also with this uh, new stuff, it's, uh, uh, that has not been a problem for a long time, uh, running even on uh, no sensor nodes, so you can get really, uh, reasonable performance uh, uh, with the coding. Uh, I know some people that are looking at quick and looking at how to put in, for example, a sliding window code. What would be, in your opinion, this starting point because there are multiple implementations. Uh, for example, the Go one, and there's the one that is now sort of being lifted out of Chromium, I think. Yeah. And, so, and so I wonder if you have some advice there where you could point people to say this is a good place to look. It depends on what you're attempting to accomplish. I think if you're attempting to ac accomplish an experiment involving FEC to show its um, end to end viability and maybe its uh, its performance in like, uh, like a controlled environment, I think probably the Go and implementation is actually the easiest to iterate on because it's Go. Assuming you're familiar with Go, it seems like uh, they were able to write their implementation with a lot less um, time, like, you know, develop, developer time than we were. Um, the Chromium one is, like, almost identical to what we run internally. So, I mean, it's a, um, but it's all C++. Uh, it's quite well optimized. It's not 100%. I mean, it, it still has work to do, but it's, it's fairly fast. So, if you're looking for something that's um, going to be a more production, like give you realistic uh, performance numbers. Um, I think the Chromium one is what I would recommend, and you can either pull that directly from the tree, or there's uh, something called ProtoQuick. Uh, there's also something called LibQuick, but that is, I think, now about a year behind, so I wouldn't grab that. Uh, it probably will not be interoperable with any of our servers, or at least not for long, and so it's just, um, and we're trying to move to the IETF specification of Quick as quickly as we can, so. Hopefully they'll be almost compatible or completely compatible. But um, yeah, so it depends on your use. I think. Um, yeah. oh, but for sure, there are common interests between uh, Quick, you, and this uh, research group. Yeah. So uh, I would suggest to to follow up uh, to continue this discussion and to see what uh, how can actual progress on this uh, question, which is very important to all of us. Uh, I see there is a question for Emmanuel or Nicolas. Yes, you have the floor. Yes. <laughs> Uh, just a quick question. Uh, we did not really understood the CDF uh, drawing. Um, just wondering, uh, what is the size of the quick window? So, because uh, it means there, but 80% uh, of the time you just have only four packet losses within a window. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is essentially packet losses per window. So yeah, I mean we. The window might be different, so in some cases the window might be 10 packets. Uh, this is not, uh, okay, it can be different size of a window, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is more of a, a TCB loss recovery, like, epoch concept. So it's it's not necessarily what you're used to in uh, a forward error correction metric, but, like, it, it makes sense for um, kind of loss recovery congestion control metrics. Okay. But we did not test was it like it was it in a internal network testing or in control environment or no this is uh across it's either all chrome i think this is across all chrome and youtube chrome to youtube and google traffic uh across one week in like june of last year um or probably like a million so this is public traffic uh, coming out of Google and slash YouTube. Okay, I suggest stopping questions here yeah. uh, because we are just in time. Uh, if we skip the last uh, part, um, thank you very much. So I see many opportunities for continuing this activity on FEC and uh, how to apply it to other protocols within ITF. And uh, yeah, it's very important for for us for ITF in general. I think Alison uh, will agree. So let's continue on this topic and the list, and uh, let's continue just after the meeting. We think, can take advantage of being all together to, to discuss this. So thank you, everybody, for uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to uh, do special thanks to uh, marie José. Thank you, Marie, <laughs> for your help. OK, see you next time. Bye.